left a crimson stain. He washed it white as snow. He washed it white as snow. Oh, praise the one who paid my debt and raised this life up from. Miss Rachel, we'll be reading our scripture, scripture this morning. And um, quick little announcement: we are expecting another little baby girl, little Emily. She's cooking in the oven, so prayers would be much appreciated towards our growing family. She will bring you our scripture reading now. Good morning, church. Uh, this morning's scripture reading is from Ephesians 2:8. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing; it is the gift of God not a result of works, so that no one may boast. Amen, amen. Do we have a reason to sing, church? We have a reason to sing. So let's sing this next song together.
Hollywood Community Church. Good morning, everybody. We are so glad that you have chosen to worship with us today. And so since you guys are joining us, we are starting something brand new, Kelly. Alert, alert. That's right. We have an online attendance form. You might say, Brad, what's the online attendance form for? Well, we want to know who's hanging out with us each and every single Sunday. And we also want to know is who's hanging out with you while you're watching it. So if you go into our Facebook description or our YouTube description or go online to our website, ourhcc.org, you will find the online attendance attendance form, fill out your information because we'd love to know who's hanging out with us each and every single week. That's right. And if it, you're new with us, we would love for you to take a second and fill out the connect card. You can find this on our website at www.ourhcc.org. It's just a chance for us to get to know you, come alongside you, how we can help you on this journey called life. That's right. And so now, Kelly, there's one thing that I really miss during this season of quarantine, and that's actually worshiping in person mm -hmm. with our church family. And so yeah. you might be sitting back saying, when are we going to be able to get back together? I really want to be around other Christians and believers. Well, guess what? We want to, too. But the leadership wants you to know that when we do reopen, we are going to make sure that we follow all safety protocols, all yeah. CDC guidelines, because at the end of the day, we want you and your family to be safe and protected. So rest assured that we're working through. We don't have all the answers figured out yet, but we are working, we're seeking wisdom, we're talking to government officials, we're talking to other church leaders. So we wanna make sure that once we reopen it, we are doing it in a way that protects everybody involved. So stay tuned. You've also should have received an email with all this information about some of our guidelines for reopening. If you haven't received it, please reach out to us. Send me an email, brad at ourhcc.org and I will make sure that you get that email from Pastor Brian. So rest assured, we're going to be back sooner than later, but we're going to do it safely. As we come to the offering, we want to let you know that we have opened up a fund for COVID-19 relief. So if you're sitting back saying, I would really love to get involved and donate some money to help those that are in need, you can go to PushPay and there's a tab underneath PushPay that would allow you to give to COVID-19. And so we want to make sure that every penny, every dollar that is donated towards this COVID-19 relief goes towards helping those who are in need. So that might be somebody who's fallen on hard times because they lost their job or they're working less hours. So it could be a financial need. It could be for food. It could be for baby supplies. Mm -hmm. The needs are endless, but we want to make sure that we're able to be the hands and feet of Jesus during this time. So if you want to give towards that, just go to PushPay and find that tab COVID-19 relief. Now, on the other side of that coin, if you're sitting back and you're saying, man, I've kind of fallen under some financial pressure and I am in need of assistance, please, we want you to reach out. Send an email to hcchelp at ourhcc.org. And this is an opportunity for your church family to come alongside you and help you with any financial assistance that you might need. So please do not miss this opportunity. Don't feel embarrassed. Don't feel ashamed. This is done out of love. This is what God has called us to do, to love each other, support each other, and especially during these difficult seasons. So please reach out if you are in need. We would love nothing more than to help you and your family. Yeah, so as we go into our time of offering, church family, we just want to take a second and thank you again for your generosity. You guys have blown us away every yep. week. Well, you continue to give even in these unknown times because of your generous giving. We have already been able to help some families in need from COVID. We've been able to continue carrying the gospel through our city and to the world. So thank you, thank you, thank you. If you're wondering how you can give, we have four ways. First is you can mail us your mm -hmm. giving. Second is you can go online to our website, www.ourhcc.org. Third is you can text the numbers on the screen. And fourth is you can pay through our app. And again, we can't thank you enough for your continued generosity. All right, let's pray at this time. Father in heaven, we thank you for being our great provider. And Father, we thank you that in your presence, there is peace, there's joy, and there's love. 
Father God, we know that during this season it's difficult to hear all of the noise that's surrounding us, Father God. But we thank you that it is your sweet, gentle voice that calls us, that calls us into yourself, Father God, and that you desire a loving relationship with us, Father, and that when we come to you and we allow your spirit to minister to ours, Father God, we realize and recognize that you are in control that we can trust you with everything, Father God, that this world is not falling apart, that you, the world is not spinning into chaos, but you are ordering it according to your perfect will and plan. So Father, we thank you for how you provided for all of us. We thank you for the opportunity that we have to love others the same way that you loved us. Father God, we pray that your name will be honored and glorified in today's service and that your son's name would be lifted up and that he would draw all people unto himself. It's in your beautiful name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, let's continue worshiping together. You're the God of this city. You're the King of these people. Morning, Hollywood Community Church family guests, and uh, maybe you're watching for the very first time. We're so glad that you are participating in our service today. I am so excited this morning. Today we begin a series of messages that, quite frankly, I have dreamed of preaching for 10 years. Ever since I came to Hollywood Community Church, I, I wanted to take our church family through the book of Romans, but never felt like it was time. Well, we believe that now is the time. 
Although every book of the Bible is inspired by God and necessary and helpful in our Christian walk, the book of Romans has been used in an extraordinary way through the centuries to point people to Jesus. Augustine lived in the latter part of the fourth century. He had a Christian mother and a pagan father. He had devoted himself to a life of immorality and loose living. One day he was walking through a park and he overheard a group of children who were playing and were singing a refrain from a children's song that simply said, take up the book and read. At that moment, Augustine felt like he was being prompted by the Holy Spirit. And so this man who was an unbeliever grabbed a Bible that was close by, opened it up, and it fell open to Romans chapter 13. And he read the latter part of Romans chapter 13. Coming to verse 14, he read, Put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to gratify its desires. The Holy Spirit of God immediately convicted him, and he became a follower of Jesus Christ. We know him today as St. Augustine of Hippo, one of the great fathers of the Christian faith. In the year 1515, there was a Catholic seminary professor who had struggled with guilt. He had struggled with shame for years, realizing that he could never fulfill the demands of the law And that seemed to weigh on him. Uh, One semester, he began teaching through the book of Romans. In his studies, he began reading about the righteousness of Jesus Christ that is available for every believer. The Holy Spirit used the book of Romans to turn a light on in his mind and his heart. And he gave his life to Jesus Christ. That man was Martin Luther one of the fathers of the Reformation. I'm sure many of you watching this morning, your life has been changed and transformed by the truth that is found in the book of Romans. Maybe you traveled down a road that we simply call the Romans Road to Salvation. And it it was this book, it was the truth of this book that caused you to see your true spiritual condition and you gave your life to Jesus Christ. How exciting. Maybe you're watching today, though, and you've, you've never read through the book of Romans, and this is, the, this is new for you. I trust that this study will be just as exciting for you as well. So, so this summer, our plan is to walk through the first five chapters of this great epistle. Next summer, we're going to pick up the latter part of the book and, and continue in the book. Here's a cool thing, though. We're not going to be taking this journey, this journey alone. Cedar Creek Community Church in Grafton, Wisconsin, a church that is pastored by my son Mark, will be taking this journey with us. They will be traveling with us. tomorrow. This morning, they are starting this exact same series, and we'll actually do some sermons and chats together. This is going to be so good. So today, we want to begin with a word of prayer, asking the Holy Spirit of God to do in our hearts what he did in the heart of Augustine what he did in the heart of Martin Luther, and what he's done in the hearts of countless other people. Would you pray with me today? Holy Spirit of God, we pray today that you would take your word. We pray that you would open our eyes, open our mind, help us to understand the truth of your word and apply it to our lives. Help us to gain not just head knowledge and maybe facts about this book, But I pray that the truth of this book would transform us and not only help us to realize who we are, but help us to realize what our mission is and to fulfill that mission. And it's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. So before we dive into our passage today, let me just give you a a few introductory facts of the book of Romans. Romans was written by the Apostle Paul from the city of Corinth, Greece, in the year 57 AD, when he was on his third missionary journey. Some have characterized this book as Paul's greatest work. Interestingly, though, Paul had never visited the city of Rome. He'd never visited this church before he wrote this epistle. 
This book is actually divided into, into two parts to simplify it. The first part is extremely theological, what we're going to look at, at least the first part of the first part of the summer. And the second part of this book is extremely practical. This book contains a detailed explanation of the gospel. And so our goal as we go through that this summer is for us to clearly understand, for us to clearly grasp and embrace the gospel of Jesus Christ. So this morning as we begin our study, we, we want to answer three simple questions. The first is this, who is Paul? Secondly, what was his message? And thirdly, who are you? Who am I? The, the Apostle Paul addresses that as followers of Jesus Christ, what is our identity? So we begin with the first question this morning, who is Paul? And so if you have your, your Bibles there or your device there, turn with me to Romans chapter 1. We're going to begin in the very beginning. Romans chapter 1, and let's begin just reading verse 1. So here's what it says, Romans 1.1. 1, 1. Paul a servant of Jesus Christ, or of Christ Jesus, called to be an apostle, set apart for the gospel of God. You probably notice that Romans begins with one word. Actually, it's a name. It begins with Paul. Now, from a literary point of view, it's, it's interesting how that begins because uh, you and I would begin our correspondence in a different way. We would begin our correspondence if we were writing someone with a salutation to the person uh, to whom we are writing. So we would write, you know, dear Brian or dear John or dear Sally. First century letters, though, began differently. First century letters began with the identity of the writer, the identity of the author. So Paul begins this letter signing it as he would. Paul, a servant of Jesus Christ. So we ask ourselves today, okay, if Romans was written by Paul, who is Paul? Let, let me just give you a couple simple facts, and some of these you may know or you may not know. The first is this. Paul was converted to Christianity through a personal encounter with Jesus Christ. Acts chapter 9 graphically details for us the events surrounding Paul's persecution. You can flip back with me to, to the book right before Romans, Acts, and go with me to chapter 9 and, and notice Paul's conversion story. Verse 1 of Acts chapter 9 says, but Paul still breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. So you know instantly that Paul not only wasn't a believer, he wasn't for Christianity, but rather he was against it. So Paul was breathing threats and murder against the disciples of the Lord. And so he goes to the high priest. He asked him for letters to the synagogues at Damascus so that if he found any belonging to the way. The way was a term that was used for Christianity in the first century. So that if he found for any belonging to the way, men or women, he might bring them bound to Jerusalem. And as you read this, you immediately see that Paul was one angry and determined dude. Paul, Paul had no sympathy, no compassion for the followers of the way. And as the text said, it didn't matter to him if they were men or if they were women. In his mind, they deserve to be punished. And so as the events of Acts chapter 9 unfold, Paul is on his way to Damascus to arrest followers of Jesus Christ. But God had other plans for him. As we continue reading in Acts chapter 9, verse 3, it says this, Now as he went on his way, he approached Damascus, and suddenly a light from heaven shone around him, and falling to the ground, he, Paul, heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, Saul was his name before he was converted, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And Saul responds, who are you, Lord? And Paul hears Jesus say, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. Rise, enter into the city. And you will be told what you are 
to do. Uh, I never get over that conversion story. What a fantastic conversion story. It, it, simply speaking, here's what happened. Paul met Jesus and his life was never the same. Uh, Paul's life before Acts 9 is completely different than his life after Acts 9. Before Acts 9, he was against Christianity. He was opposing it. He was persecuting believers. And as Jesus says here, he was persecuting Jesus himself. But in Acts chapter 9, he meets Jesus. And his life is forever changed. Let me pause for a second and ask you a question this morning. Have you met Jesus? Have you had a personal encounter with Jesus Christ? My question this morning is not, have you read of him? Have you studied about him? Have you heard of him? But rather, have you had an encounter with Jesus Christ? Now, quite frankly, your encounter probably is going to be way different than Paul's encounter. I'm not asking you today whether a light knocked you off of a chair and whether you heard Jesus speak verbally to you. But my question is this, have you met Jesus And as a result, has your life been forever changed? You see, Paul, an unbeliever, was converted through a personal encounter with Jesus Christ. Paul tells us a second thing about himself. Paul identifies himself here as a servant of Christ Jesus. Quite frankly, the the term that that Paul uses here um, would be somewhat offensive in our present culture. The, The Greek word that is used here for servant actually means slave. (laughs) Pretty strong word. A New Testament slave was, was not a hired servant. A New Testament slave was not an employee that could come and go as he or she pleased. A New Testament slave was a person who had been purchased, and once purchased, that slave was his master or her master's possession. So so Paul is saying today, identifying himself, that he was not just a servant, he was not just a follower of Jesus Christ, but he was a slave to Jesus Christ. He actually fleshes that out and In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, as he's talking to the Corinthians, he makes this statement. He says, Oh, do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit within you, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price. So glorify God in your body. As we read that and we understand that, there's an unbelievable irony in that statement. Because one of the most glorious truths of the gospel is the fact that in Jesus we have been set free. We experience unbelievable freedom in Jesus Christ. We experience freedom from our addictions. We experience freedom from our weaknesses. We experience freedom from our failures. We experience freedom from condemnation. Yet here's what Paul is saying. In being set free, we are called to enslave ourselves to Jesus Christ. He becomes our Lord and he becomes our master. In other words, Paul is defining his Christian experience, saying that he has completely submitted his life to Jesus Christ. I would ask you today, Is Jesus your master? Are you a fan of Jesus or are you a follower of Jesus? Is Jesus someone whom you admire or is Jesus someone to whom you have submitted and surrendered your life? Paul says that he was a slave of Jesus Christ. He identifies himself in a third way here in this verse. He calls himself an apostle. He actually says that he was called to be an apostle. This is a a significant affirmation that Paul makes about himself and about his ministry. Apostle is a term that, that, that not just anyone can apply to himself or herself. It's not like we can start calling Brad, Apostle Brad, or Jose, Apostle Jose. 
In the early chapters of Acts, the, the church had set forth requirements for apostleship. To be an apostle, one had to meet at least one of the following criteria. They had to have been a disciple during Jesus' earthly ministry. They had to have been an eyewitness or an eyewitness to his resurrection. Or they had to be directly called by Jesus himself. So we know that Paul failed the first two tests. He wasn't a disciple during Jesus' ministry, and he wasn't present during the resurrection. But Paul fulfilled the last one because there on the Damascus Road, in that encounter with Jesus, he was personally called by Jesus himself. It's interesting, the book of Acts repeats Paul's conversion story three different times. Why is that? I believe that it repeats it over and over again to remind us that Paul is an apostle. And as a messenger of Jesus Christ, he doesn't speak with his own authority. Rather, he speaks with the authority of Jesus. So who is Paul? He's a convert of Jesus Christ. He identifies himself as a slave of Jesus. And he is an apostle. He is a spokesperson of Jesus Christ. The second question that we want to address this morning is this. What is Paul's message? Now, quite frankly, we're not going to spend a lot of time on that this morning because that's the purpose of the series. And during the next four months, we're going to flesh out Paul's message as we look at these first five chapters. But Paul gives us a brief glimpse of what he is going to be talking about in the first two verses. Notice what he says once again. Paul, a servant of Christ Jesus called to be an apostle, notice this phrase, set apart for the gospel of God, which he promised beforehand through the prophets and the holy scriptures concerning his son who was descended from David according to the flesh. Paul's message simply was summarized in the phrase, set apart for the gospel of God. That's the title of our message this morning. The two-word phrase, set apart, means separated or segregated. We kind of understand the meaning of that. It doesn't have the same terminology, but kind of like the idea of quarantine, that somebody who's been sick has been set apart. They've been segregated for the purpose of protecting everyone else. Different application. Paul wasn't separated or segregated because of sickness or anything like that. He was set apart for a purpose. He was segregated for a purpose. Paul was set apart. He was called, as it were, to proclaim God's message. And here Paul tells us very clearly that that the message that he was proclaiming was not his. It was God's message. If I told you this morning that I had some good news that I wanted you to hear, your ears would perk up and you would be interested in what I was going to say. But if I added the good news that I want to share with you today is a message that comes from God, after initially thinking that I might be just a little bit crazy, you would want to hear what I had to say. Because if I was sharing good news that didn't just come from Brian, but it actually came from God himself, that would be life-changing. That's exactly what Paul is saying in the passage. He was set apart. He was segregated for a purpose. He was called for a purpose to declare the gospel of God. And he tells us two things. And by the way, that that term gospel has the idea of good news. And so Paul is saying that he has this, this good news, this excellent news that he would like to share with us. And he tells us two things about that good news. Notice, first of all, he says that it was promised in the Old Testament. He actually said, which he promised beforehand through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures. Now, sometimes you and I, we make distinctions between the message of the Old Testament and the message of the New Testament. We talk about the Old Testament as law and the New Testament as gospel. Or sometimes we say the Old Testament is law and the New Testament is grace, as if they're 
were no law in the New Testament and no gospel or no grace in the Old Testament. At times, we picture God as being angry in the Old Testament and loving in the New Testament, almost as if the message of the Old Testament is different or distinct from the message of the New Testament. Paul blows those arguments out of the water. And I can't wait to dive into that point because as we go through these first five chapters, we're going to see that Paul's message is the same message that was told over and over and over again in the Old Testament. And Paul actually uses many Old Testament scriptures to prove that the gospel that he is preaching is the same gospel, the same message that God has always had. I would remind you, though, that Paul wasn't the first person to to do that, to preach the gospel from the Old Testament. If you'll remember in Luke chapter 24, after his resurrection, Jesus was walking along the Emmaus Road with two different men, and he was beginning to tell them about himself. And Luke 24 makes this great statement. It says, in Jesus, beginning with Moses and all of the prophets, interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. So Paul says that this gospel, this good news that he's going to be sharing with us is the same one that was promised in the Old Testament scriptures. He tells us a second thing about his message, and it's simply this. It is about Jesus. We read verse 3, let me read it again, concerning his son who was descended from David according to the flesh and was declared to be the son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. Man, is that deep. In just two verses, Paul gives us a complete Christology or a complete theology of Jesus. To summarize, he talks about two things. He talks about Jesus' humanity. He talks about who was descended from David according to the flesh. We realize that, that, that Joseph and, and David weren't his biological ancestors, but Mary was. And so, and so Jesus literally descended according to the flesh from David, we see his humanity, but we also see his deity. Because Paul tells us that Jesus was declared the Son of God in power. So we see Jesus as man, and we see Jesus as God, both his humanity as well as his deity. We also see his humiliation as well as his exaltation. The fact that that Jesus came from heaven and took on the form of man, Philippians chapter 2, that humiliation of Jesus Christ. But we also see in this passage his exaltation because Paul talks about Jesus being resurrected from the dead. And Paul alludes to that later, as I just mentioned in Philippians chapter 2, that he says, as a result of that, one day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Here's what Paul is saying. His message is Jesus. In the coming weeks, we will see that Jesus alone is the answer to our depravity. We will see that Jesus' death fulfills all the demands of the law. We will see that faith in Jesus results in our justification, our sanctification, and ultimately our glorification. Jesus is the message. So this morning we've asked and answered, who is Paul? We've asked and answered, what is Paul's message? But I want you to see the third thing. The third question is this, who are you? Because here in these very few verses, or these very first verses, Paul addresses who we are in Jesus Christ. Notice verse five, he says this, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith for the sake of his name among all nations, including you who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. 
to all of those in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I love what Paul does here because Paul doesn't set himself up on a, pe- on a pedestal as if he reached the status that you and I can never attain. To the contrary, Paul shows us here that, that we, as followers of Jesus, have the same identity and the same mission as him. You see, like Paul, you have been set apart. Like Paul, you have been called. Every Christian, every follower of Jesus Christ, and every church has been called out by God. The Greek word for the term church, ecclesia, literally means called out ones, or or individuals who have been set apart for a purpose. So for what have we been set apart? What is our purpose? Paul gives us three things quickly in the text. The first, he says this, you are called to belong. I love verse six, including you who are called to belong to Jesus Christ. I love that phrase. You are called to belong, not just to Hollywood Community Church, but you are called to belong to Jesus Christ himself. Catch this truth. You are not an outsider. You are in the inner circle. I love how Paul talks about that in in his letter to the Ephesians. In Ephesians chapter 1, verses 5 and 6, he says thus, For God predestined us for adoption as sons through Jesus Christ, according to the purpose of his will, to the praise of his glorious grace, with which he has blessed us into the beloved. In other words, what does he mean? That he has has placed us in Jesus Christ, and we belong to him. I love the words of the old hymn, Now I belong to Jesus. Jesus belongs to me, not for the years of time alone, but for eternity. You have been called to belong. He says a second thing, you are called to be a saint. Notice verse 7, to all those in Rome who are loved by God and called to be saints. We could say to all those in Hollywood who are loved by God and called to be saints. A saint is not something that you will one day become. A saint is something you presently are. The word for saint in the New Testament is the word that means sanctified one. One who has been, here's our theme today, set apart by the Holy Spirit. If you have placed your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ, you're not going to be a saint. You are a saint right now. At this very moment. Look at the person who's worshiping with you there in your living room or in your house. Look at them and say, I'm a saint. Go ahead, tell them, I'm a saint. And now look at them and say, you are a saint. You see, everyone who has placed their faith and trust in Jesus Christ are called to be saints. Psalm 31, 23, love the Lord, all you his saints. Ephesians 2, 19, so then you are no longer strangers and aliens, but you are fellow citizens with the saints and members of the household of God. Paul even says that as a saint, man, there's so many benefits that you receive. Verse 7, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. As a saint, you receive on a daily basis God's grace. It's not just something you received at the moment of your salvation, but every single day you are a recipient of God's grace and God's peace which is beyond our comprehension, even in the darkest moments of our life, God offers us his peace. So you're called to belong. You are called to be a saint. And he tells us a third thing. We are called to do. In other words, we are called to a mission. Go back to verse 5. He says, through whom we have received grace and apostleship to bring about the obedience of faith 
for the sake of his name among all nations. Here's what happens, and I love how this, ha- this transpires in the past, but, or in the passage, but Paul's call that he talks about in verse 1 becomes your call. It becomes your call and my call. Paul's mission to bring about the obedience of faith among all nations has been passed on to us. In other words, we not only belong to Jesus Christ, we're not only saints at this moment, but we have been called to a mission. We have been called to do something. So today we begin walking through the first five chapters of the book of Romans. Here's my heart today. As we begin this study, my my desire for you and for me is not just for us to grow in the knowledge of, of the gospel. That's going to happen, and we're going to comprehend it and understand it in ways that maybe we never understood it before. But my desire is that for us as a church to grow not only in understanding the gospel, but living out the truth of the gospel in our homes, in our communities, at work, to live out this mission that we have been given through our actions, through our work, to enhance the kingdom of God and to point people to Jesus. Let's be set apart for the gospel. Let's be a church on a mission. Would you pray with me as we conclude today? Lord, thank you so much for the truth of these verses. Thank you for for calling Paul and placing your call and your empowerment upon his life. Thank you for the message of the gospel, that it's the same message that has been preached from the very beginning, and it centers on the person of Jesus. And I pray for each and every one of us who are watching today. I pray that first and foremost that we have had a personal encounter with Jesus Christ, and as a result, we've, we've repented of who we are, and, and we want to become who Jesus wants us to be. And help us to realize that we belong to Jesus. As followers of Jesus, we belong to him. We are saints. You are are sanctifying us and molding us into his image. And you've given us a job to do. Help us to live on mission this week. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. song.
three. Church, thank you so much for worshiping with us this morning. We pray uh, God's favor and protection over you. We can't wait to see you next week. Uh, check back our social media pages to stay up to date with what we're doing. And uh, yeah, we love you guys. See you next week.